You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You have my sword, and you have my bow, and my trowel. Hi, you're listening to episode 29 of And My Trowel, where we look at the fantastic side of archaeology and the archaeological side of fantasy. My name's Ash, and I'm Tilly. And today we're sorting out the absolute mess that Tilly has created. Me? What about you? You didn't know it was Ah. there either. (laughs) This place is a state anyway. We have so much junk here. How am I meant to take account of one tiny soul-bound painting? Uh, You wanted to be the archivist. No, 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 no. I said I would do some of the archiving until the wizards sent an apprentice to help us out. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see our issue. Oh, why is it always bloody wizards? Mm. Honestly, they're never punctual, never on time. No. Okay, well, hang on. Maybe we should catch up our listeners on our little predicament here. (laughs) Okay, that's a good idea, Tilly. Okay. So at the end of our last quest, we stumbled across a painting that neither of us had seen before, but maybe Tilly had. I don't know. Maybe she has. I don't know. (laughs) On closer inspection, though, it's an oil painting, and it's an extremely old, perhaps mummified old man on it spindly white hair clings to his desiccated scalp his paper skin is peeling away exposing the ivory of his skull beneath he seems to be wearing a victorian outfit but we can't really tell because it's torn and festering Mm. even though it's a wooden frame it's extremely dilapidated and crumbling and splintering in the middle of that frame though sits an oxidized bronze plaque with the name carved into it (gasps) tilly I'm going to need you to roll a perception check. Ooh, okay. It's a three. (laughs) You failed. (laughs) Oh, Oh, no, I can barely see (laughs) the name. (laughs) So dirty. I think, though, maybe it says Dorian Gray. Um, no, apparently this one's Gorian Dre. Oh, right. Oh, maybe it's his cousin or something. (laughs) Well, maybe. Well, now we figured out something else about the painting. Apparently, it's cursed as well. (gasps) Soul bound. Which means that there's a living soul inside of it, taking all the sin and ill deeds from the person bound to it, making it age and wither. Oh, geez. Well, uh, what should we do with it? Honestly, I have no idea. But don't worry. I've already called someone in who might. Jess, are you there? Hi. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god jess <laughs> hi jess it's amazing to have you back i can't believe it vampire teeth and now a cursed painting is there anything you can't do <laughs> no yes, she's back <laughs> she's back she's back she's back like the terminator um, <laughs> ready to solve everything for us and um, because you might have remembered jess van damme is a multi-skilled okay so not only is she a forensic archaeologist and anthropologist she's also an art conservator <gasps> true So Jess, can you tell us a little bit about what art conservators do? Basically, we fix old things. So whether that be paintings, objects, (laughs) old clothing. So pretty much anything you find in a museum, probably an art conservator worked on it at some point, hopefully. Interesting. And like when you say we fix things, so art conservator or like your background in specific things, like have you is it art in terms of like paintings is it art in terms of like objects is it can it be anything it can be anything i'm not trained in painting so this is a little outside of my purview Ah, but fine (laughs) (laughs) it's all the same right that's right (laughs) so yeah so it can be anything so things that i've worked on are like a japanese dollhouse an ancient egyptian mummy coffin model ships cool Sorry, I'm just going to stop you there. You just like passed by going an ancient Egyptian mummy coffin. <laughs> like when you say an ancient Egyptian mummy coffin, you mean like the, it, is it like a wooden thing that it's enclosed in or how, like what, what is that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was wooden. So it was the, the, like the case that the mummy like sat in. Cause usually there's like multiple layers of coffins so like sarcophagi and so there's a oh. whole bunch of layers depending on how much money the deceased individual had but this one was the one that like went directly oh, right. around the mummy which was very cool. cool but it had some old repairs on it that were truly terrible i'm talking brown oh, no. horrible colored paint just covering this thing covering original <gasps> decorations terrible infills oh it was awful so 
that wasn't exciting. When was that repair from? What time period was uh, that repair? I think the eighties, I think is what we figured out. There was oh, only oh, like typical literal <laughs> slides. Yeah. Like old slides. Our Gen Z crowds are not gonna know what these are, but we know these are slides. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we had to sit through slideshows following every single holiday. While our oh yes, brought exactly. out the projector. <laughs> oh my god, you had a projector? Wow. We had a projector. Oh, oh wow. yeah. We were fancy. That was very fancy. Damn. We just got really horrible like photos back you know from the camera guy oh yeah like, from the, when he had to send it all it was like, i mean my dad's uh, yeah. finger over the lens and like, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. and you realize there was a massive smudge on the lens that you didn't actually know about and yeah. so every single picture is ruined yeah yeah, yeah but lens like you know 1995 has just gone forever that memory <laughs> <laughs> but so when you're conserving you're not just conserving like the degradation or whatever of an old object you're also having how often is it that you actually have to conserve a previous attempts at conservation in comparison to actual degradation it kind of depends on the object. I've come across a lot that have not been repaired ever. So then okay. you have a fresh slate, which is kind of nice because then you don't have to curse the conservator that came before you. Okay. But then there's so many that have had multiple conservation efforts and at different times they use different materials and some were effective and some were not. So it's it's definitely a mixed bag. Hmm. And this mummy case, I'm just curious about this mummy case now. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Like you said, there was like the brown paint all over the thing, all of these repairs, all these horrible stuff. So like, how do you actually go about repairing that? Like, do you just cover it with a different kind of paint? Do you, you use a different kind of material? Yeah. Like what's the, what's the process? Luckily, the brown paint that the conservator used was acrylic. And so a pretty standard solvent acetone took it off without mm, damaging nice. the underlying surface. So that was really convenient. And then the there was cracks in the coffin lid. And so this conservator had filled them with like styrofoam and some sort of glue. And so I literally cut it out, like cut out all these fills styrofoam. and then oh used styrofoam. Oh my God. This is like so 80s, <laughs> isn't it? My thinking? God, plastic, plastic, <laughs> plastic. My yeah. Goodness. Yeah. And like, <laughs> to be fair, there are some plastics that are very useful and they're very stable. They they don't mm -hmm. degrade over time, but you can never be sure with old repairs whether this is going to hold up or going to do something else to the object. So I went in and used more archival materials and didn't paint over the original decorations and try to integrate the okay. new fills with like appropriate paint, basically. Okay. So, so is this... Oh. Sorry, go on, Ash. <laughs> Sorry. It's so in sync. <laughs> so is this the type of material that y that is your favorite? Yeah, I typically like organic material. I find it a lot more forgiving than say like metals or glass or ceramic, which are very difficult. And I mean, they're just more solid. So they just don't mm -hmm. bend and work with you. Whereas organic materials like wood or plant material or textiles they have a lot more give and so when you're trying to repair or stabilize or increase their longevity they they work with you a lot more consistently that's so interesting because i thought organic would be m more difficult because it's so also porous just that. yeah yeah well, sometimes that means that the, like, if you're using an adhesive or a glue, it will adhere better because there's more pores for the adhesive to, like, go into. Whereas mm -hmm. ceramic, what's odd about ceramic and glass as well, it, when they break, there is a weird tiny bit of deformity that happens when they break. And so oh. they will never line up precisely how it broke. So you're always going to be struggling with trying to arrange this thing back into some sort of shape, but it's never going to fit it's precisely. Like where it's what's that thing with the with the gold? It's a Japanese, I think, like method of fixing broken cups and stuff with the gold paint. Oh yeah, what is that called? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm gonna quick. Oh, but now who gets to be like? Oh, I know what it is. <laughs> I know what it is. It's Kitsugi. Oh, I happen to know. It's Kitsugi. <laughs> <laughs> we totally didn't just look it up. No, nope, we totally no, didn't look it up. We no totally Googling knew that off the top of our heads. Not Google at all. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, that just reminds me of that because, yeah, I guess then that's the whole point is that you know it's 
been conserved. So, I mean, when you're when you are conserving something, are you trying to basically make it look as much as possible like the original, or are you trying to sort of, I don't know, like update, not update it or upgrade it, but do you know what I mean? Like, also, it's like when people do buildings and restore buildings, and they try to almost show that it's a restoration, so it's clear that it is a restoration. Is that the point with conservation, or is the point to make it look like there hasn't been any conservation work? It's weirdly dependent on who you're working for, what the object is, what the object's Mm. being used for. There's been a number of curators that I've worked for that want the repairs to be like fully integrated. So from like about six Mm. inches, you can see that it was altered in some way, but from six feet, you can't. And so that's generally the rule of thumb in the US, at least in museums, at least the museums Mm. I've worked for. This might not be the case in like, I don't know, California. But in the UK, I've met a lot of conservators who like to really highlight that things have been altered or repaired. And I know that there's some conservators who like to repair chairs with like, like if they're missing a leg, they'll replace it with like a clear, like fiberglass leg that's the same shape as the others, but it's just clearly a different, it's just new. Actually, yeah, I've seen, I've seen stuff like that. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it really depends on the object and what what they want. I don't know. I follow, yeah. I follow what people want rather than what I think they should be doing, typically. But, but do you also then in the background just be like, oh, that's an interesting choice. See, see I would have maybe done it this way <laughs> or something, like try to subconsciously. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, there's one oh. curator specifically that I worked for who we were working on this ship's figurehead that had layers and layers and layers of paint. Most of it lead, lovely. Oh, And the original paint colors we had like cross sections of. And so we knew what they were at the time, like one specific iteration of this woman with a dress and what color hair she had and stuff like that. But there wasn't enough original paint left to go down that far. And this thing had been worked on for 11 years. It was going out on display in like nine months. So we did not have time to like, just cut off all of this paint. So (laughs) me and my colleague decided rather than get to this original layer that the curator wanted, we would just paint her to look like the original layer that he wanted. Uh, And we kind of had to lie a little bit. Uh, (laughs) Hopefully he'll never listen to this. If, I was about to say, if you're listening to this podcast, we're totally talking about a different figurehead. Yeah, like, this is yeah, not the yeah, same. We're done many. <laughs> no, no. Although this is Jessica Van Damme, it. not Jessica Van Damme. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely not Claude. Claude Van Damme did that, I think. Didn't he? <laughs> but what was funny is, so like he thought that we had gone down to this original layer. He came down to the lab and saw like all this like new paint and like how lovely it looked. And he was like, Oh, this is exactly what I wanted. You did guys did such a great job. I'm so impressed that you got down that far. And we're like, yes, we absolutely did. This is not new paint. (laughs) Hides paint palette behind back. What do you mean? New paint? (laughs) Would you not smell the paint? Like, I mean, I mean, it's just acrylic, so it's not, it doesn't smell particularly. It doesn't smell too bad. And I, you know, and curators are in their own little world. They're, they're a special breed. Okay. Okay. (laughs) And I suppose as well. So when you're talking about the mummy, especially you're working with human remains, right? So how, how do you give them back? Can you get them back to that state? Why do you do it to get it back to that original casket or sarcophagus or sarcophagi? Why, why, why Um, do that? (laughs) <laughs> so, <laughs> well, with the the coffin specifically, I mean, this thing was covered in so much. I mean, truly, the worst shade of brown I've ever seen. Paint <laughs> Mommy that it brown, felt disrespectful. Hey. Uh, actually, not not far <laughs> off. Uh, but like in like it covered her like the on the coffin. There was a, like a face, right? Because they're generally humanoid sort of shaped, and you couldn't see the eyes because they were covered in this brown paint. Aww. So that felt. Aww. Like that wasn't what the deceased would have wanted because, you know, the mm. the, the like image that effort. is presented yeah. on their coffins and on all of their funerary equipment is to, you know, lead them into the afterlife with this like golden image, you know, to make them mm. attractive mm-hmm. and pretty and wealthy and godlike. So the fact that you couldn't see any of that meant that this deceased individual wasn't attaining that afterlife that they had planned for. So returning it back to 
not quite original. Like you can still tell that it has gone through time and space because obviously it was in a <laughs> college in Pennsylvania, <laughs> not in Egypt. So oh, and right. not 2000 years ago. <laughs> so bringing it back to sort of what they would have wanted it to be, but also having gone through time just felt more respectful and more, you know, aligning with their intentions. And it's the same thing with working with human remains. I always think about what would the deceased have wanted from me to do. So sometimes it's not do anything. And then there's other times where it's like, oh, I could fix this and make it nicer. And then that's maybe what they would have wanted. And then sometimes you're dealing with still living cultures. We come up a lot with this in the United States with Native Americans and indigenous Alaskans Mm -hmm. where we don't want to make any changes to their art unless they have told us to. So it's a a collaborative process. So yeah, Yeah. it kind of just depends. Well, it sounds like you'll definitely be able to help us with this quest then. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Hopefully. (laughs) See, Ash, we'll get this mess sorted in no time at all. And maybe we might be able to find the owner of this cursed painting as well. Yeah, I mean, how did we even pick up a cursed painting like that? No oh. idea. No oh, idea. wait, hang on. Uh, I think the postie's at the door. I might have my order from the Amazons. Oh, we'll excellent. be right back. Hello and welcome back. Did you get your delivery from the Amazons, Jess? I did. It was um a bit more bloodier than I thought it would be, oh, but hey, that's yeah. okay. You know, I support female-owned businesses. True, very true, very true. And, you know, during the break when you were away at the door, I started to think we really should start this quest with the tale of Dorian Gray. You mean because- Dorian Dre. Ugh, Dorian Schmorian, fine, whatever. You tell us his tale then. Okay, so the portrait of Dorian Gray Do you is mean a- Dorian Gray? <laughs> <laughs> Well, this one we're talking about is cousin first, because right, I'm true, assuming sorry. Dorian came before Gorian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's the original. <laughs> but it's a classic tale of a gothic tale, actually, of mm. beauty, hedonism, and sensual Victorian morality. <laughs> written by Irish author Oscar Wilde in 1890. So it tells the story of a young man named Dorian Gray, who gets his portrait painted by the enigmatic painter called Basil Halward, which I never think is a very e- enigmatic name, Basil, oh, but Basil. makes I me think, think of Basil Towers. Brown. Basil. Oh, I think of Basil Brown, like the uh, archaeologist from Sutton Hoo. You're, you're just too much of an archaeologist indeed. Yes, I'm, yeah, I'm too frivolous. <laughs> uh, but Basil is... Uh, <laughs> she's very frivolous. <laughs> um, but Basil is infatuated by Dorian's beauty. And Dorian, oh. after getting his portrait realizes that his beauty will fade one day so he tells of his desire to sell his soul in order for the painting to fade rather than himself Uh so his wish is granted and dorian embarks on a life of a libertine (gasps) all the while his portrait records every wrinkle and every perceived sin he wrought So basically, the portrait is a reflection of Dorian's misdeeds and a curse upon his very soul. Ooh, spooky. (laughs) Excellent. So it's a cursed object. Excellent. That's fine. We're fine with objects, right? Yes, we are. That's good. But it's a cursed object with a living soul trapped inside. Oh, and how do we go about conserving a a living object? Jess, any ideas? (laughs) Ooh, I certainly have my work cut out for me. It'll <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. be something new to add to your CV. <laughs> yeah, it's like exactly. mummy, Dorian Gray, like, yeah, cursed, cursed soul. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, okay, we're going to be in the archives, so maybe we'll start there. I, what other, like, cursed or soul-bound objects can we find in the fantastical or the archaeological record? Well, I can think of one. Yes. The One Ring. <gasps> of course. Yeah. Has to be, right? Of course. Yeah. It's like it, the ultimate yeah. cursed object. In a way. Yeah. I mean, it embodies and amplifies corruption of Sauron. And <laughs> also, if you've watched The Rings of Power, why did they make him hot? It's so <laughs> conflicting. <laughs> I just can't deal with it. <laughs> Like that hair, oh god! Like it should, they should. I know he has to be beautiful as the gift lord of gifts. I was about to say, like, is that the whole point? On. Like he has to. <laughs> Don't do that to me. Are you saying you would also have made the rings for him? Oh my god, absolutely! When Glad, when he was like, "Be my queen, Gladriel," I'd be like, "Absolutely, <laughs> not a problem. Let's just get rid of all of Middle Earth. Not that's fine. Wouldn't mind." 
<laughs> okay. So the Wandering. I grew up on Labyrinth and David Bowie. Like, it's the same. <laughs> but it's the Wandering, yes. So it doesn't really physically change in appearance necessarily like Dorian Gray or Gorian Dre's portrait, but it represents the bearer's moral degradation. Yeah, fair, fair. Do you have any ideas, Jess, for soul-bound objects in, in fantasy literature or otherwise? Well, there are the Horcruxes from the Harry Potter series. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's true. I always forget about them. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because they uh, literally contain a fragment of his soul, right? Well, yeah. Well, specifically Voldemort's in those in that series, but yeah. presumably yeah, yeah. any wizard could try to do that, I guess. I don't know. Seems yeah. silly it's just like me, really but dark magic isn't it yeah dark. Is it, you have to i think i remember you have to kill to be able to have it so that's proper that's proper i mean that's not being a libertine that's like Just plop, proper dark yeah that's yeah. proper proper dark man saron would do it though wouldn't he saron he would, would. He would. Not, yeah so he'd be like nothing on you voldemort <laughs> <laughs> who would win in a fight Oh no, no um, competition. Yes, no I competition. There has to be Sauron. No way. He can literally just like come back whenever he wants. Like, you well, know? Technically so can Voldemort. Yeah, but only well, if you destroy all the Horcruxes, no. Yeah, no, but if you destroy the ring, also no. And technically, Voldemort has like multiple Horcruxes, whereas Sauron just has one ring. I'm making it's making me think now. <laughs> We're still going with Sauron. Okay. I mean, we have to. We are the we Anne Trial podcast, aren't we? Yeah. So. We are literally based it's, it's, it's educational, you know? Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know. Leave a comment on the next Instagram post. Who would yeah, win? Exactly. What do you think? Who, yeah, yeah, we're going to make an Instagram post about this. Who would win in, a, would win? in a battle to the death yep. of One soul of those bound poles. objects? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. One of those pole <laughs> malarkeys. <laughs> but, uh, what do the yeah. kids do? I'm, I don't know. Oh, I don't, who knows? <laughs> I don't know anymore. But I was trying to think. So, of course, I was trying to think of Terry Pratchett, right? Mm, and obviously. What that would be. And I couldn't actually think of one. And it was Ash actually who suggested one to me. And then I was thinking about it. So, yeah, in, in Witches Abroad, there's like mirrors. Mirror magic is used. And that kind of, it shows kind of the true reflection so, for example, there's like a, a a frog who gets turned into the prince, but when you look at it in this special mirror, you see him as a frog, not as a prince. But that's, I don't know if that's like, I guess it's sort of similar because Dorian Gray's picture actually reveals his true self rather than his sort of outward appearance to the world. Yeah, yeah that makes I sense mean, to me. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense to me. So- <laughs> I managed to get Terry Pratchett in again. <laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> Do my best. <laughs> I also thought of, I've not read this one, but it's the Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell books by oh. Susanna Clark, and it's the portraits in it. So there's like magic infused portraits, which are created by the magician, Mr. Norrell, and they kind of serve as like a channel, but then they're sort of revealing hidden truths and affected by the the magic that of the person they represent and things like that. So that's very kind of similar in a way. It's yeah. not necessarily a soul bound but it's a portrait in yeah. fiction it makes me think of the paintings in uh harry potter as well yeah, yeah. that's true yeah we're oh, we just paintings. gonna do a harry potter episode yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was inevitable. i mean it's pretty big fantasy uh, universe i guess it was sort of uh yeah inevitable that at some point <laughs> we would have to deal with it but, um, <laughs> but but yeah but to be honest i couldn't think too much i don't know i was just thinking and i can't actually think of that many examples of kind of objects similar to dorian gray's picture like this kind of object sort of a soul bound Something. Yeah, the only one that I could really, really think about was in D&D. And obviously it's not fantasy. Fic- it is fiction, but it's not maybe, you know, it's in the, the annals and like all those kind of the handbooks and stuff, but it's yeah. not necessarily a written series or something, which is the soul coins you get in D&D. Ooh, um, okay. So they're an actual coin and they're a currency in the Nine Hells, which is Avernus. Uh-huh. And they're infused with like the tormented or despairing souls. <laughs> oh, oh. And they're made of like infernal iron. So literally it is a person's soul who's like given up their soul to a devil. Oh, That's okay. the only thing I, one I could really, really think of. But also I play too much Baldur's Gate. So I mean, it's actually, I've just, well, although it's not like a cursed soul, but it kind of is. It depends on your perspective. The genie, like 
technically yeah. uh, is but that's is, like a fae or like a magic right person. but with the yeah. lamp then be like a soul-bound object like the yeah. genie is intrinsically like mixed up with the lamp that's true yeah i would say yeah, that the can, genie soul is yeah. bound to the object unless it's freed right uh, aladdin yeah, which you yeah. should. By we do can you your third free wish? yourself from Dorian Gray's picture, though? I don't think so. How it's two endings, isn't there? I, I don't actually. How spoiler alert! It's been out for a while. If you haven't read it yet, <laughs> skip ahead a little bit. How does the book end? Like, how does it does does it get does, does the painting get destroyed and that destroys he him? Destroys it. So oh, okay. again, spoiler alert! At the end of the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, Dorian Gray kills Basil. And then with yeah. the same knife, he stabs the portrait, thereby killing himself. Oh, okay. <gasps> yeah. And do they say what happens to the portrait out of curiosity? Does it then become his young self again? I think yeah, the does. portrait returns to its original state and then his body is found with all the disfigurements and wrinkled and you know, yeah. gnarly on the floor. Yeah, okay. Oh, g- try and explain that to the police. Blue. Right. <laughs> yeah, <we're nightmare. laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and that well, happens in in the uh-huh. the League uh, of Extraordinary uh, Gentlemen, which is an excellent fantasy film. <laughs> it also has Dorian Gray in it, <laughs> featuring Sean Connery, exactly, and featuring Dorian mm-hmm. Gray as one of the characters. I can't remember the actor who plays him. And yeah, the same thing happens. His the picture is a horrible thing, and he, they destroy the picture, and that's what then like makes him die, basically. Yeah, because there's also the. The movie that came out, oh god, like fifteen years ago or something, with um, Ben Barnes. <gasps> with Ben and... Barnes, who yeah. speaking of good-looking gentlemen, <laughs> I mean, yeah, definitely my sexual and... awakening as a child while watching Prince Caspian. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, which is because of Aslan or no? <laughs> he's Prince Caspian. <laughs> I know he is. I know he is. I always got annoyed at that because they don't end up together. It really, just. I just couldn't deal with it. You were a romance person even then. Yeah, I know. I was like, oh, <laughs> why wouldn't you go back? <laughs> oh. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, he's got a castle for God. Right, anyway. <laughs> I feel like this episode is getting slightly off track. Because yes. All of us <laughs> keeps going. <laughs> we should really get on to the archaeology. <laughs> That's true. Are there any archaeological artifacts that are similar to Dorian Gray's picture? <laughs> Well, I had a little look, and uh, <laughs> I was thinking funerary masks. Oh, okay. So the itch, ancient Egyptian death masks. Okay, so we have kind of got an Egyptian theme going on this episode. Yeah, yeah. So, like the famous mask of you know Tutankhamun, and they're kind of created as to, uh, to preserve that sort of idolized shape or image of the deceased. And they sort of reflect the belief in immortality and serve of conduits between the physical and the spiritual. So maybe that's kind of how Dorian's portrait is capturing his true self and passage of time. But these masks are eternal and like unchanging of the person that they depict, you know? Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, they're forever, forever young in that respect, almost, forever even though they're dead. Young, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly do you have any any other insights after having of course worked on one of these you know coffins or the the mummy cases or uh, however we want to call it can you attest to that <laughs> it did make me think of the uh Shwaptis or Ushwaptis or however you want to pronounce this very strange Shwaptis? egyptian word Shwaptis is usually oh. what i hear they're, what about, they're I these think tiny little there are these tiny little figures, either they're sort of like pharaonic shape or humanoid shape, and royal tombs would be like filled with hundreds of these, and they would be the servants in the afterlife. So they aren't really like <sighs> souls per se, but then they they act as people in the next life. And so they're sort of like a one for one kind of. Oh, okay. And yeah. were they representatives of real life servants? Like were real servants sacrificed in order to create the Shwapti or? I don't believe so. Don't quote me on that though. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if we can believe the 1999 classic starring Brendan Fraser. <laughs> Sorry, Brendan Fraser. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They that love a sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. They love to they sacrifice. Do. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. I, you know, ask my Egyptology friends. 
<laughs> but I suppose they're very similar, almost like as effigies of people, the terracotta army as well. True. Also, because they're yeah. also individualized, right? Yeah. Like each I, one is unique. Yeah, unique. And they're kind of that kind of form of immortality and power, you know, as yeah. well. So kind of the same as the eternal youth sort of theme you get in, in Dorian Gray. Which technically you could argue that all sorts of like the Greek statues all of the old depictions of like kings throughout the year, throughout history, like are kind of similar in terms of they're always an idealized version of the person they represent. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Definitely. Like how they used to send uh, portraits to like prospective spouses in the royal family. Right. Yeah. The ultimate like catfishing. Anne of Cleves. Anne of Cleves. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, gosh. I swear she's this pretty. Look, look at the picture. I bet of her. she was, and Henry was just a big old poo. <laughs> you know? Like, I had some choice words, but I wasn't going to say them. <laughs> and actually, we've already talked about an object that is kind of similar. Which oh. is our Mesoamerican mirrors, which we <gasps> talked about. Obsidian the mirrors. Obsidian mirrors. Which I'm obsessed course. about because I got that wrong in our quiz. Yeah. And so I always remember it now. <laughs> Episode 20, in case anyone's mm-hmm. interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is kind of a window into another realm and a person's soul. Yeah. So it's kind of analogous. Al- 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 <laughs> Similar to. <Analogous? laughs> Similar to Dorian's portrait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Then and, and that's almost like the worth oh gosh, that's getting proper deep and metaphorical there. Like if you know, with the mirror, and because indeed you see your true self. So it's similar to what we were saying in the fantasy fiction with the mirrors that you see you don't see what the rest of the world sees, you see what you yourself see. You always see your yeah. own flaws in a mirror, right? Yeah. So it's like all of these objects we've talked about seem to embody a cultural or ritual kind of significance that reflects the concepts of what transformation, immortality, and the hidden like nature of human behavior. Yes. The so there's not <laughs> corrupt power. Yeah. So there's no really direct archaeological equivalent to a magical soulbound portrait that reveals a person's like corruption. Weird that. <laughs> Weird <laughs> enough. Weird that there's no cursed soulbound objects in the archaeological. Yeah. Oh it just God. shows you how amazing what? Oscar Wilde was and how creative yeah. he was. Yeah. But, you know, they, these kind of objects do kind of serve as symbols of hidden truth, immortality and power. Yeah. Oh, Ash, did you close the archive door? Oh, no. Did the books escape again? <sighs> yes, they did. Sorry, Jess. And sorry, everyone, for listening. We're going to have to just quickly go and catch them before they find their way outside again. It took forever to round them all up last time. So we need to cut short this episode of At My Trial, but don't worry. We're going to be continuing our chat with Jess all about soulbound cursed objects and art conservation in next episode with part two. In the meantime, as always, we're always looking for new episode ideas, new guest speakers to come join us. So if you have any suggestions, do get in contact via email or social media. All of our contact info can be found in the show notes. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, download, all of those kind of things wherever you get your podcasts. And do make sure to check out the rest of the wonderful shows on the Archaeology Podcast Network. In particular, we have some new shows who have joined Mm -hmm. us in the last couple of months, including one who, if you're a fan of this spooky episode, you might enjoy called The Past macabre which also deals with egyptology so go check that out our lovely stephanie rice so uh yeah until then bye see you next time bye Bye. this episode was produced by chris webster from his rv traveling the united states tristan boyle in scotland dig tech llc cultural media and the archaeology podcast network and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.